All right, so uh, our second talk is uh, Climate Change and Animals, uh, and is being taught by Jonathan Lovehorn, who I mentioned before, teaches both our uh, wildlife law course and our farmed animal law and policy course, and spent uh, most of last academic term with us as our first policy director. Um, for more than a decade, Jonathan Lovehorn has served as chief counsel and senior vice president for animal protection litigation at the Humane Society of the United States, where he supervises a legal team of dozens of in-house and pro bono attorneys prosecuting more than 40 cases a year. Mr. Lovern also holds, ac holds academic appointments here at Harvard Law School, at Yale Law School, Georgetown University Law Center, and New York University School of Law. Uh, there he teaches courses on animal law, wildlife law, foreign animal law, and climate policy, and has published a number of articles concerning the intersection of animal law, environmental law, and food policy. Um, John personally has litigated extensively on behalf of animals and the environment, written hundreds of state and federal animal protection laws, and served as the primary legal strategist for major state animal protection ballot measures like the one here in Massachusetts that was passed two years ago. Uh, he received an LM in environmental law from Northwestern School of Law at Lewis and Clark College and a JD from the University of California Hastings College of Law. So please join me in welcoming Jonathan Lovon. I should have stipulated a, a waiver of reading of the bio, but that's okay. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to talk about climate change and animals, as you see. Uh, it's in the news a lot, but you know how it relates to animals and animal policy is an area that we don't spend a huge amount of time on outside the farm animal context. Uh, I want to thank the Harvard Law School Animal Law and Policy Program and all of its supporters. Uh, almost all of the research and publications that we're going to talk about here were done either during my time at Harvard or with support from Harvard, including uh, some student research assistants, uh, one of whom is in the room, but I won't point out any name names, uh, uh, unless something's wrong. And then we'll, uh, we'll uh, but, uh, and uh, I also want to point out that the thoughts I'm going to give you and ideas are my own. They don't reflect necessarily the views of any particular client or employer. Uh, these are my academic thoughts with regard to climate change and animals. Okay, so unless you've been on a long sea voyage without internet, um, you've seen the amount of activity going on with regard to climate change, including these pieces from the wild-eyed radicals at the Wall Street Journal uh, and The Economist. Uh, it's in the news more and more, uh, the impacts. Uh, it, it's a constant barrage of media, uh, which tells us there's a problem, but tells us very little about what we need to do about it. So I'm hoping to get a little more granular as we address this particular problem. I'm not going to give you the big summary of impacts of climate change. Some of the major ones that affect animals are too much water, including sea level rise and flooding, or too little. Uh, my brother and his family and their pets live in uh, uh, New Mexico, and I need them to get out. Uh, given where the water maps are looking as we get towards 2050. Um, we're going to talk a lot about disasters, and particularly climate-enhanced disasters. It's very hard to tie any particular disaster directly to climate change uh, academically, but there's pretty good evidence that these various disasters that are coming in greater intensity and greater frequency are enhanced through climate change. And we've seen that just in the last month. Um, and the connection between disasters, animals, uh, and people is something I want to spend a little bit of time talking about. The first paper spends a significant amount of time talking about the intersectional impacts of climate change, how it impacts various public interest causes, and really it's all about vulnerable populations. Vulnerable populations of people, vulnerable populations of animals, and how that is the core of where climate change hits first. It will be a very long time before climate change significantly affects uh, the 1% of wealth in this country and other countries. It is the vulnerable populations of people and animals that will face the brunt of this. Um, and we can see this in the data, right? We've seen studies of the demographic impact of Hurricane Katrina. The number one indicator for whether or not mortality occurred in Katrina was economic. Could you afford a car to get out of the way of the hurricane? That was number one. Number two, won't surprise anyone, which was race. The majority of fatalities were primarily in African American neighborhoods. Um, one area that they don't talk about much in the literature is the connection between companion animals and hurricane mortality and the failure to leave. 
this narrative of not getting out because of animals persists, even though we went in after Katrina and changed the law to require FEMA to allow animals on uh, rescue uh, transportation and shelters, we still hear stories. I didn't leave, I didn't evacuate because I've got so many animals. We've heard it in all the major hurricanes that we've faced recently. So I'll come back to this a little bit, but that connection between <coughs> companion animals and human deaths and human impacts is, is a major one. And it's very clear the connection between people, animals, climate, wild animals, domestic animals, this is all interrelated. And one example I'd like to use is this story, which you may or may not have seen, about the child who died from anthrax in Siberia. And what we saw there was that anthrax had stayed dormant, frozen in the ice for some 75 years. And then as the permafrost melted, um, the uh, reindeer carcass was exposed, which had anthrax. And a, another animal fed on that, then the reindeer fed on that animal, and then the child ate the reindeer, and the next thing you know, you have anthrax. Uh, related death. So this cycle of disease, climate, animals, and humans is a really important one, and it's becoming more and more important. They think that there is smallpox buried in the permafrost and even potentially bubonic plague. So these diseases that we spent all this time eradicating uh, are stuck in the permafrost just waiting to get out. And in the permafrost, as you can imagine, animals and people are buried very shallow. So it doesn't take a whole lot of melting to start exposing uh, these diseases to humans. So this cycle is really, really important. You know, and humans and animals have been interrelated with climate and climate adaptation since the beginning. We relied on horses for thousands of years as our primary mode of transportation. Long before we had petroleum, we used whale oil for centuries as our primary uh, type of petroleum project. Product and when we discovered petroleum, uh, fossil fuel petroleum, and this is the earliest uh, uh, internal combustion engine in the Smithsonian, there was this belief that the discovery of internal combustion power was going to save whales and other animals. This is from Vanity Fair in 1861. And the longer you look at this, the more interesting it gets, particularly the frog waiter, and then I don't know what is going on here or what this is, but, um, but there was this belief that the discovery of internal combustion and petroleum was going to somehow save whales. In fact, what we saw was the discovery of petroleum only intensified whaling and allowed it to mechanize and industrialize in a way that actually led to the widespread destruction of whales in the 20th century. Um, so these cycles are going on all the time. And with regard to petroleum, we usually see the more direct effects, right? So this is the Exxon Valdez or the Gulf oil spill. This is what we typically see and understand about fossil fuels and animals. But the indirect effects are actually far more pernicious. So the collective emissions um, really hits animals hard. If I get nothing else across today, is that animals go first. So Rachel Carson, Silent Spring in 1964, talked about animals going first with regard to the crisis with chemical pollution. Animals go first in climate change. Um, and so they literally are the canaries in the coal mine. This, I couldn't resist putting this in. I don't, does anyone know what this is, by the way? You've seen this before? OK. So this is a canary resuscitation device from 1896 that British miners would use. And so you'd open the door and go down into the mine, and then when the canary started to go down, you would shut the door and turn on the oxygen, which sounds very humane, but I worry it might have been just to keep from having to keep buying canaries. But anyway, <laughs> totally off topic. But I just, I, I find this fascinating. OK, so um, animals are going to go first. And they're already going in many ways, and particularly in the Arctic. So we have particular areas where animals are getting hit the hardest. Marine species in the Arctic, particularly problematic. Food chains are being disrupted by melting ice. Um, we have numbers on some of these mortalities, which we don't have in other places, which I'll get to in a moment. Some animals will benefit from climate change. I do not want to overstate the case, right? There are circumstances where animals will benefit from changing climate. And some animals will adapt and move 
trees are actually moving towards the equator. I mean, sorry, towards the poles from the equator. Uh, really interesting things going on with regard to adaptation. But the question is, can they really do so quick enough in order to survive? Um, another problem is that most of the global warming energy is going into the ocean. And so much like the, the, the frog in the frying pan in the, in, the, in, the, in the water, these species can't see this coming and can't adapt the way land species might be able to. So what we've seen over the last three years, which has driven a lot of my research, is really an alarming increase in mass die-offs, particularly in marine environments. Um, mass mortality events happen all the time, but it is like climate disasters. It's a question of the frequency of these events, which we get concerned about. Um, this particular case in 2015 in Central Asia, um, this endangered antelope species lost some 211,000 members in a single spring. Huge, huge mortality event. And the interesting thing about this mortality event is when they studied it, what they discovered was just a couple degrees change in temperature took what were ordinarily benign gut bacteria in the animals and turned them into devastating um, uh, microbial risk. So these animals literally died from a change of a few degrees at the wrong time. So why this particular case animals die all the time? Well, this tells us that many animal species are probably a lot more vulnerable to climate change, even small changes than we even realize. No one predicted this particular mortality event. No one knew this species was vulnerable to this particular type uh, of, of temperature change. Okay, so I know this is pretty depressing, I'm sorry. So let's get it over with and tell you how bad it's going to get. According to what is believed to be one of the better meta-analyses of total species mortality, you, we can track the amount of species loss at different climate targets. So right now we're probably most likely looking at a business as usual trajectory where we would see a 16% loss of total species. Um, if we get it down to three, that gets down to maybe 8.5. Um, but this is a huge number of species. But talking about species can be a bit misleading, right? There are these huge conglomeration of individuals. What does this tell us about actual animal loss? And one of the things in the data uh, is um, there are huge changes and impacts on animals and populations at the subspecies, subextinction level. And even some indication that there are massive billion level mortality events that happen all the time without triggering extinction. And for every extinction that occurs, billions of non-endangered animals have probably died in the process. So species gives us a very twisted lens, very narrow lens actually, on what we're actually dealing with. So we've studied a lot with regard to species loss from climate. But we know almost nothing about total animal mortality from, from, from climate. Um, my paper did a few rough calculations with some help some people that were smarter than me. And just the species-based loss would come up to something in the order of 147 billion animals over 20 years. And that's only species loss. That doesn't include non-species level extinction events, mortality events. This number is actually likely much, much higher. Um, the only thing that can compete with it, this is that level of loss uh, amortized out over 20 years, about 7.5 billion a year. And really, we don't know at all. But the only thing that can get close is animal agriculture. Uh, and I'll obviously exceed it. Um, these other three sources of animal mortality, I had to pump them up in the chart in order for them to actually show up on the graph. Um, that's how huge the difference is. And we're going to talk about animal agriculture in a minute. Okay, that's pretty upsetting, right? So that's wild animals. Let's talk about companion animals for a minute. Um, unfortunately, we know even less about companion animal and farm animal mortality with regard to climate than we do with regard to wild animals. Because in the wild animal case, we at least have studies about species extinction that we can extrapolate from. So we're really left with a series of news stories and other events that give some idea about impacts on companion animals. You may have seen this just from a few days ago. Um, this is what's left of a boarding kennel uh, after the hurricane in Florida. Um, miraculously, all the animals survived. 
I'm not sure how, but they got very, very lucky. So a lot of these facilities are in harm's way, and a lot of them have no plan or no infrastructure or idea what to do about disasters or ability to get out. And we see this over and over again. So in Katrina, coming back to Katrina, best friends estimated somewhere around 60 to 70,000 companion animal mor mortalities. It's very hard to know what the actual number is. Some half a million were estimated to be displaced by that one hurricane event. Most people saw this uh, troubling image uh, from Texas of the dog tied with the rising waters, even though there is a specific Texas law that prohibits abandoning non-livestock animals. If you want to abandon livestock animals, you're free to do so, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so too much water is a problem. Not enough water is a problem. Heat waves are a huge issue. Um, they're an issue for people as well as animals. I talk in the first paper that the estimates of heat wave deaths suggest that by 2030 in the United States, heat-related mortality events will exceed handgun violence in the United States which gives you an idea how many people are working on handgun violence versus how many people are working on climate resilience. Um, animals in heat are a big problem. Everybody knows this. We see a huge uptick in deaths and heat distress events when the temperatures go up. And we're not even going to have time to talk about wildfires, which are a whole other area of climate enhanced disasters that impact companion animals. There's obviously huge disease risks as well, so ticks, Mosquitoes, Lyme, all of these various vectors love hot, wet weather. So as things get hotter and wetter, the risk of these goes way up. And the other thing that I have to get across is if anyone you know goes out rescuing animals or people in a flood, please take precautions. The water that is out there is incredible. The stuff in North Carolina is a toxic mix of CAFO excrement, uh, human sewage, unbelievable risk to go out there in the water uh, unprotected. And those diseases can translate between humans and animals. OK, other animal facilities, we know almost nothing. Research labs, zoos, aquariums, <coughs> we have very little information. I found a little bit in my first paper. Um, this is the Louisiana Aquarium. They lost. 10,000 animals when Katrina came through, all in one day. We've had other circumstances. Before Sandy, the New York Aquarium considered evacuating their fish. I don't even know how you would actually do that. Uh, there is, yeah. Um, and we've seen other things where floods and other things take out zoo and animal facilities. This one was particularly bad because it killed all of the livestock animals in this particular zoo. And the seal and the polar bear, though, took advantage of the situation and managed to escape. Uh, the polar bear was kind of hanging around, but the seal made it into a river and almost got out. But anyways, the, these events, we keep seeing them. And the way we talk about them is extremely problematic. We don't talk much about the animal lives lost. This one is a particularly problematic news story, right? Valuable research lost. Mm -hmm. And you get to the bottom and 35,000 animals drown in this facility in one day. But they're talked about as valuable research. So we're not really even thinking about this. And you may have seen this. Oops. Whoa. OK. Yeah. I'm almost trying that. Let's mm -hmm. see if I can get the video to run. <coughs> this footage from North Carolina, a lot of these animal holding facilities have no plan whatsoever for what they're going to do in the event of an emergency, and particularly floods. Um, there's no requirement to have a plan. There's no discussion about these plans. Mostly you just hope that Good Samaritans come and make things better. Moving on to agricultural animals, <laughs> we get into really huge numbers. The situation in North Carolina was particularly bad because the storm came ashore right where the concentration of CAFOs is in North Carolina. So here's some footage um, Compassion World Farming put together to give you an idea of what was going on. It's a little jittery, but very jittery. 
So you can see the roofs essentially ripped off these facilities. Those are laying hens or broilers in the water um, at those facilities. Very few of the animals actually got out in North Carolina, which I'll talk about in a second. Most of them ended up staying inside. Um, and this was news for maybe a day or two, but we really don't think about what do you do. This is 1999, where we saw huge amounts of animals outside CAFOs. And there was a lot of discussion that perhaps the reason we didn't see that this time was that the operators closed the doors in order to keep the animals from coming out so it wouldn't look as bad. Uh, I don't know if that's true. Um, there is another reason why well, let me talk about fish for a second. There's another reason why we might not have seen that many animals outside those CAFOs. The fish loss in North Carolina was enormous. I don't know if anyone saw the footage of the fire department using fire hoses to try to clean the amount of fish off the highway for miles at a time. The number of fish loss, I don't even know how to estimate that from a single hurricane. But that's not really talked about either. Um, so these pictures from 99 that were so controversial, we really didn't see this this time around, instead it looked more like this. I don't have any reason to know whether or not those facilities intentionally kept the door shut to keep the animals uh, from getting out. But I do know in 99 that these animals getting into the environment was a huge problem because farm animals, before they're slaughtered and cooked, are essentially massive disease vectors. So if a huge number of these animals and their manure leaves these facilities and gets into the waterways, it's a huge problem. So I'm still waiting to see whether or not someone told those operators to keep their doors closed, to keep those animals from getting out. We have a lot of systems in place to take the disease from those animals and make sure they don't hopefully get into the food supply. But if those animals leave those CAFOs uncontrolled, the environmental impact can be, can be massive. So what happened in North Carolina? Well, there's a specific law in North Carolina banning abandonment. And now, while there's some discussion about um, justifiable excuse and there's an exemption for standard agricultural practices, the question is, would this be standard agricultural practice? We don't really have to ask that question because no one is going to enforce this law against factory farms in North Carolina. That's essentially not going to happen. And just to give you an idea, what we are enforcing in North Carolina is they went after this woman who decided she didn't have her license yet, but when the hurricane came, she took in animals without a license, and they prosecuted her. But the social media outcry was so massive that they immediately dropped those charges uh, against her. So that's sort of where we focus. We don't focus on the large scale abandonment of animals. We focus on sort of the small thing that's right in front of us. And this headline is particularly troubling. So the hurricane is coming. What are we going to do about it? We've got millions of animals confined in these facilities we're going to hurry up and try to harvest the tobacco and other cash crops before the hurricane gets here, but we're not going to do anything about the plight of the animals in these particular facilities. Just close the doors, forget about it. It's insured loss. They're not even treated as, as living beings. Yeah? John, the, the, you mentioned the massive number of fish. Yeah. Are those fish from fish farms? No, wild fish. Yeah, incredible losses. Um, so this is sort of the attitude that you see. They're not even considered in, in storm preparation. They're not considered in disaster planning. They're just not entities. So what do we do about all this? One of the things that I've had trouble with as I talk about climate change in animals is it all feels very overwhelming and abstract. So I'm going to talk about some very specific things that I think we need to think about. Um, this dog was rescued, just want to make that clear. Uh, sorry, uh, I know this could be kind of a heavy topic. So it's possible to do a campaign entirely on climate change in animals, but this is one of the, the, the donkeys that drowned in the Duluth Zoo. Um, but there's a lot we can do short of launching a full-scale climate and animals campaign. So what we talk about in climate policy is adaptation and mitigation which are just shorthand fancy ways of talking about changing our infrastructure to be ready for climate and mitigation is reducing emissions, essentially. So I'm going to talk about mitigation first and, and, and emissions uh, and what we might do. So in my second paper is mostly about refocusing our efforts on methane. And there's a lot of reasons for that. 
One of the problems we face is most people don't understand climate science. So if you find yourself lost in this space, I highly recommend this book. It's only about 100 pages. You can read it in an afternoon. And it will give you enough to understand the basics of climate policy, which sadly are not very well portrayed in the media uh, or the popular press. I highly recommend it. OK, the thing about climate change is it's not like the hole in the ozone that we famously had with the CFCs. And then we banned the CFCs, and then the hole started to close. The Pixies wrote a song about it, and everyone thought about it for a while. And then now you know, we, don't, we don't think about this problem. Climate is totally different. So climate change emissions, the carbon aspect of this, don't go anywhere at all for a very, very long time. So whatever CO2 you use today, either through transportation or what you ate or any other use that emitted CO2, if you come back in 100 years, 60% of it will still be waiting for you. If you come back in 1,000 years, 25% of it will be waiting for you. So in light of these increasingly dire warnings about climate change, there's a lot of questions about the degree to which CO2 mitigation policy now can do anything over the near term. If we shut down all the lights, parked all the cars, you know, lived in teepees, and turned in our computers and our Netflix, everything else, the, the CO2 would stay and we would continue to warm for more than a thousand years. So methane, I know, sorry, that's very depressing. Methane is a little different. If you look at this chart about the lifespan and life cycle of various greenhouse gases, methane only hangs around from eight to 12 years. So there's a lot of other interesting things about methane. We know a lot about methane. We know about its human-caused sources. It's a much simpler uh, greenhouse gas. This lifespan actually gives us an opportunity for mitigation that other greenhouse gas pollutants do not provide. So this is the EPA's chart of total greenhouse gas emissions. And you look at it and you think, well, methane is only 16%. But methane has 86 times the warming potential of CO2 over a 20-year period. So it's a much stronger greenhouse gas than CO2. Now, with regard to the sources, this is where things really start to get fuzzy. This is EPA's effort to hide the relationship between industrial agriculture and methane. Can anyone find all the animal methane on this pie chart? Yeah, so enteric fermentation is code for things that cows do. Um, <laughs> And then we've decided to take manure management from livestock and move it to the other side of the chart as if someone's not going to notice, right? <laughs> because if you put them together, what you would get would be 36. And you would see that animal agriculture is the largest source of methane. Now, these numbers have been modified and played with and a lot of other stuff going on. And climate numbers are the squishiest of all numbers. But we know that animal agriculture is a huge component of methane, which means animal agriculture is a huge opportunity with regard to near-term climate mitigation. Here's a chart of some of the methane sources and what their trajectories are. Very troubling, especially if you eat uh, wet paddy rice, which is you know, extremely problematic from a methane standpoint. But we won't get into that right now. Um, so the major sources, at least in the United States, that we have to get under control immediately if we want any kind of mitigation for climate are oil and gas, landfills, and animal agriculture. Um, it won't surprise you that there is currently no plan to do any of that. There was a partial plan to address the oil and gas methane emissions and landfill emissions but that has now been put on hold and rolled back by the EPA. So it's open season on methane, essentially, right now. There was never a plan with regard to animal agriculture. Congress has consistently defunded EPA from doing anything about emissions from animal agriculture. OK, so what can we do? Well, in the third paper, I start to look at some other ideas about how we can try to clean up the food system. And the food system, we would have to stay here the rest of the day and into the evening to talk about everything that's problematic in the food system. We can't get into that now. But a couple of things are worth noting. You may have seen 
this study that came right on the heels of the big climate report talking about how the current food system is not environmentally sustainable. I can't believe I used that word. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, and how are we actually going to feed our population in a way that doesn't destroy resources, whether it be climate, water, or land? This is the, the actual uh, article that was published about keeping food system within environmental limits, which is going to be very, very hard for a number of reasons. First of all, the food system is incredibly fossil fuel hungry. In order to bring food, whether it's animal agriculture or regular plant uh, uh, calories, you need 12 calories of energy in to get each calorie of food out. It's a tremendously fossil fuel intensive process. Overall, what you eat is up to 30% of your total greenhouse gas footprint. When we talk about agriculture, we tend to imagine something like this, a very highly technical, <coughs> organized system of feedback and, and science and, and all these great monitoring. We have smart drones keeping everything going. This is what the agricultural system actually looks like. Massive amounts of inefficiency and waste, just on a, an inexcusable scale. So overall, food waste, and here's the pitch for eating more food if you haven't had it yet. <laughs> Massive amount of what we make to eat ends up being wasted. And all the resources that go into that, all the emissions from that are ultimately wasted. And so one in three units of food that we produce globally never actually make it to someone's mouth. Can you imagine if one out of three gallons of gasoline that we produce never actually powered any cars? This is a complete scandal from an energy and resource standpoint. If food, were, if food waste were a country, it would be number three on total greenhouse gases. It's an incredible amount uh, of impact. But it's even worse because when we talk about food waste and most conversation of food waste, we're talking about consumer waste and transport, spoilage, date labels, all these other things. There's another big problem in this farm to table system that people don't talk about, which is waste through inefficiency. <laughs> So in 2017, this article came out where Alexander and others looked at six sources of losses from farm to table. Where, are we, where is food waste really getting us? But the interesting thing about this study is it looked at the efficiency of production as a matter of waste. And what they found out was out of all food waste, 40 to 60% of all losses are from livestock production incredibly inefficient way to bring calories to the table. So on top of this massive food waste problem, we also have a huge inefficiency problem with how we raise animals for food. So here's a chart of energy efficiency of a typical internal combustion engine. 25% conversion rate from fuel in to energy out. The theoretical limit is somewhere around 42% for internal combustion of efficiency. This is a coal-fired power plant, the big bad guy of climate policy, right? They're the one that we're spending so much time focusing on. 35% conversion rate. I think you know what's coming next. Here's the conversion rate for animal agriculture, from energy inputs to outputs. 9% for pork, 21% for poultry, 31% for eggs, 14% for dairy, and 3% for beef. It's incredibly problematic efficiency rates. So this is all loss. This is just like throwing out food in the trash. This is loss of calories, massive loss of calories. And every calorie, remember, we're putting emissions out and we're burning petroleum for every calorie. So we have a huge problem in this way. So the other mitigation step we have to do is retire these dirty and inefficient food production methods. They have to be identified and phased out just like we've done with regard to inefficient sources of human energy. Um, big meat, dairy, emissions, I'm not going to go through all of this, but there's a lot of data on this floating around, you know, rivals all of Germany's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, the top meat companies rival Shell, BP, Exxon in their total emissions. This is a huge problem with our policy, mainly because, as I said, the inefficiency. We grow food, but we don't take it to the supermarket. Instead, we ship it sometimes halfway around the world. China alone imports 60 million tons of soybeans to feed agricultural animals. And then we put it through this secondary process where 
For every seven calories in, and this is a good exchange rate, you get one calorie out at, at best and a lot of pollution to go with it. And then you put it back on another transportation source so we can have meat at the grocery store. So this entire process results in roughly 20 times more greenhouse gas emissions per calorie for pork and chicken and a whopping 150 times more for beef. All lost in that system. And the demand is just going up and up and up and up. Unlike other sources of greenhouse gas emissions, meat is just going through the roof, mainly in China and other countries racing to keep up with our levels of consumption. Okay, so other mitigation, and I realize I'm going longer than I should, but um, we need to challenge the concept that any of this is sustainable. The concept of sustainability, as I argue in the third paper, is incredibly problematic. You can attach it to anything. You know, we see these charts a lot in academia and policy about these circles of sustainability and healthy growth and all of these things. This is a complete wild west, and it's mostly just advertising language. So we can have sustainable hamburger, you can have sustainable coal, um, you can have sustainable bananas, sustainable palm oil, sustainable soda, and then my personal favorite, the green grill, which is literally cooking the earth. I don't know who thought that this was going to be good environmental advertising. I didn't, this is not Photoshop. Um, so we throw this word around. Oh, and you can also have sustainable funeral, which actually I looked at this. This, is, this one's legit. Um, so, um, but this concept of sustainability that we talk about really looks more like this. These circles of intersecting exploitation, inefficiency, pollution, waste, and inefficiency. This is really what the food system looks like. So we need to get everything we can out of it. Part of that mitigation is making producers pay the true cost of their production, whether it's environmental or labor or otherwise. This needs to be done in order to make sure that the prices that they charge reflect what they're actually costing us. Another one is to accelerate transition to clean and efficient food. This is the economist chart of the day from yesterday, actually, um, talking about switch to plant-based proteins. And then finally, almost finally, I got one more after this, but the, we need to un expand understanding of the impact between food consumption, climate, and animals, particularly animal wildlife and companion animals. The knowledge is out there. This study can tell you exactly what the various efficiency and emissions are of different food sources, but people don't really know. We don't think about food this way. Um, one of the things I talk about in the paper is we have fuel economy standards for cars, which even though we're in the process of rolling them back, really did increase efficiency of automobiles. The other one is the Energy Star standards. When you go to the store to buy an appliance, you're, you're hit with an incredible amount of information about the relative efficiency of appliances. What do we have for food? Almost nothing. I was really pleased to see this piece recently proposing that we simply label food according to its environmental impact. And it's important to remember the role of California in all this. California is the only state that is currently trying to do something about animal agriculture within its cap and trade, within its uh, greenhouse gas emissions policy. I think this is a real opportunity as a laboratory to try out some new policies, labeling policies, procurement policies, other things that try to get a handle on the greenhouse gas and food issue. We also have to avoid bar barriers to new ideas, new efficient ideas. Missouri's trying to squelch clean meat and plant-based agriculture. Other states, North Carolina, are toying around with this. We can't let newer, more efficient technologies die under the weight of public policy. Very quickly about adaptation, right? We said adaptation and mitigation. Adaptation's a no-brainer. We have to increase disaster preparedness. This is an animal shelter in North Carolina that had to be rescued. If our own infrastructure isn't strong enough to withstand these, these emergencies, how are we going to rescue anyone else? So we really have to improve our infrastructure across our entire animal rescue framework. We need more investments in animal rescue. How is the NGO community going to deal with a hurricane or a flooding event every couple of days rather than every couple of months? The amount of time and energy that will have to be uh, <coughs> contributed to adapt to all of these disasters is going to be huge, and we currently don't have that capability. And finally, we have to add climate into our advocacy with regard to wildlife and companion animals. 
We've done so a little bit with regard to farm animal advocacy. We talk about climate usually in support of meatless Mondays or meat reduction campaigns to some degree. But the animal community has not invested in climate the way other public interest causes have. And given the direct impacts that we're seeing on wildlife and companion animals, and the very high amount of interest, especially among young people in climate policy, this is a huge opportunity to harness that interest to do something about the plight of wildlife and companion animals and climate. This is just by way of example, the Center for Biological Diversity has done this. They've incorporated climate into their overall wildlife protection message in order to combine what's going on with climate with their overall organizational goals. So I'm sorry I went over time. I don't know if we have time for questions, but I love this cartoon, so I always put it up at the end. And this isn't meant to discourage any questions. I just think it's yeah. Fun. I think it might make sense for actually just to, we can do our, our next presentation and we can have questions yeah. for both afterwards. That work? Is that work? Is that, or does anyone have any burning question right now they'd like to ask? Oh, so um, the first two, I'll send you, but other people, um, two are in the Georgetown Environmental Law Review and the other one's in the Yale Law and Policy Review. So you can also just search under Jonathan Lover and SSRN and the, yeah. the page will come up with the papers, all of them, yeah. Join yeah, uh, thanking Jonathan Lover one more time.